What you're looking at is the last inline six rear wheel drive one series hatchback BMW is ever going to produce. The last proper one series, if you will. And for me at least, that's quite sad. That's because this M140i is quite a rare thing in the car world. You see, unlike many other cars these days, it's a car you can really bond with. And that's not because it's perfect, because, oh no, it really isn't. In fact, it's its very flaws that make it so lovable. Let's get into it. My name's Tom, and you're watching Paragon Cars. Let's go. We're on Instagram, so if you want to see behind the scenes footage, weekly updates, and some of the stuff we've got for sale, click the link in the description below. Now, I'm sure most people watching this know, but if you didn't, the BMW M140i uses the B58 inline six engine. And as widely as it's used, it's still a very special unit indeed. It has a forged crankshaft, forged connecting rods, and a closed deck design. This means it'll happily put out north of 600 horsepower on stock internals. And when you consider this thing only makes 340 horsepower in stock form, that's pretty nuts. What's also pretty nuts is the torque, as not only is there 500 newton meters of it, it comes in at just under 1500 RPM, making this feel almost like a diesel engine that can rev all the way to 7000. 0-60 can be done in around 4.5 seconds, with grip being the limiting factor. What happens though when we remove that limit then? Let's find out. Do the 30 to 70 sprint. Now, before we get to the results, I just want to clear some things up. I totally forgot to record the actual 30 to 70 time, but rest assured, unlike the footage, I had no traction issues during the real run. Also, the only mods done to this car is a double res delete, which shouldn't really impact performance. Anyway, we managed a time of 3.82 seconds. That's the same as a 575 horsepower Range Rover Sport SVR and only 0.3 of a second off of the BMW M4, Audi RS5 and Mercedes C63S. You'll also notice it the same time as the new xDrive BMW M240i, even though it's supposed to be down on power. Yeah, that's where weight comes in. The M240i is 200 kilos more than the M140i, so it's no surprise they did the same time. Anyway, interior. This is where the M140i is actually surprisingly nice. So to look at, it's not quite as eye-catching as the Mercedes A45 or Audi RS3, but the actual build quality is very good. After living with the car for two months now, I'm yet to get any consistent annoying rattles in the cabin. Plus, I think the design on the dials in the dash actually looks better than some more expensive BMWs. That semi-digital look really does it for me. Storage is good, as not only do you have well-designed door bins, but also a little cubby hole for some extra items. <laughs> then the rest of the interior, I mean, there's only really a couple of downsides. Any major one for me is the seat adjustment. BMW went for a release mechanism instead of a pump system for their manual seats, and it does make it just a little bit harder to get the perfect position. So if you can, go with the electric seats. The two other downsides is the lack of sync button for the AC, and the fact that there's no grippy bits in the cup holders. Nothing major, but it's stuff the Golf R has that just make daily life a little bit easier. Golf R also has the BMW doesn't, is space in the rear. Yeah, unfortunately, that 50-50 weight distribution and rear wheel drive setup does come with a few downsides. If you've got passengers, then you're just going to have to move your seat forwards, as it's pretty tight in the back. Thankfully, headroom is okay though, and with the ability to fold the headrests up, it's not that bad at all. The rear windows also go all the way down, which makes things just a bit more comfortable. Then the boot, again, not quite as good as its competitors, but it's also not bad either. You have a 12 volt socket, cubby spaces either side, and a flat low floor once the seats are folded down. Overall, it's really quite decent, and it's never really going to be an issue unless you want to carry washing machines every day. <laughs> anyway, enough of the boring stuff. Let's get onto the road and put this thing through its paces. So, the BMW M140i then. Now, the keen-eyed amongst you will have probably noticed that the interior in this looks slightly different than the one in the intro, and that's because this is my car, as, you know, I kind of just wanted to review my own car, basically. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, immediately around town, the first thing you notice is that this feels quite stiffly sprung. However, it doesn't feel stiff in terms of its chassis. Now, we'll get on to more of why that is later, but the gist of it is the dampers aren't quite up to the job of controlling the car's weight in its stock form. Thankfully, it's an easy fix, but um, yeah, we'll talk a bit more about it later. Anyway, things like steering, oh, it's nice and light. It's a lot lighter than proper BMW M cars, even in their comfort modes, which makes this like a really perfect daily driver. Throttle pedal, brake pedal, easy to modulate. Brakes themselves, mm, they feel a little bit spongy on the stock pads. If you want to fix that, you can fit DS2500 pads. They create a lot of brake dust, but they do make a big difference apparently, and that's probably what I'll be switching to after I go through these uh, OEM pads. But yeah, just as a daily driver, the 140i is just a fantastic car. It's comfortable, it's quiet, it's easy to drive. You really cannot fault it. And you think, you know, something like an Audi RS3, even comparing that to this car is ludicrous really because it's so much more money, yet in reality, it's kind of just as nice. You know, the interior in the RS3 looks a bit nicer, but when you look at the fundamentals like sound deadening and sound system, they're fairly similar. And uh, talking more about the sound system, actually, because I have listened to like the B&O system in RS3 millions of times because we have loads coming through the dealership. And this Harman Kardon system, I would say, is about 95% as good. I really wasn't expecting it to be that good in this, but it really is pretty decent. Then, in terms of parking, it's still a BMW 1 Series, so the parking is actually really easy. You've got quite a lot of steering lock on these in their stock form. Um, even though you get a shorter steering rack, so lock to lock is actually shorter in the 140i, as you can see, it, that's as far as I can turn it. But the wheel itself actually turns about the same, I think, and it means getting into parking spaces in one go, even when they're tight spaces, is really, really easy. Although, if you're like me, you're not very good at parking. <laughs> trying to do a review whilst parking is always a bit of a challenge. But yeah, the car is quite skinny. You don't have big haunches like you do in proper M cars. So it means, you know, when you come to a stop, it's still a very easy car to get out of. As you can see, I can easily get to the first notch on the door to get out of it. Parking sensors are nice and accurate, and this updated iDrive system is really easy to use, really intuitive. For me, it's probably one of the better iDrive systems. I know the uh, latter system is probably better once you're used to it, like iDrive 8, um, but initially, I found it quite difficult to get used to. Um, if you want to go and see a car that was using that system, I will put a link in the top right hand corner for you, as that car was a bit of a beast. Used a fairly similar engine as well. Then coming out of junctions, I'll turn start stop on, just so you can get an impression of what it's like. I turn it off, because I really hate it. <laughs> the engine is designed to use it, so you give it a half throttle out of a junction. You get a bit of tire spin from the rear, but the car just kind of deals with it. You have that fake electronic diff in the back that sort of shuffles power using the brakes um, just to make it feel like it's got a proper diff. It doesn't feel anything like a proper diff, just to put that out there. But it does an okay job. It kind of melts the power together between the rear wheels. But yeah, the low down torque of this engine is what really makes it. It is absolutely beastly. Um, Something it reminds me of is like the Mercedes C63, the W204, you know, with that big 6.2 litre V8. Because it, it pretty much always sits at a thousand RPM, yet when you just tickle the throttle, it picks up immediately. There's just zero lag, and that's what I love about the B58. Anyway, enough uh, praising this car. <laughs> Let's um, reset our trip computer and see what kind of MPG we can get. Now, this is where the B58 is also really impressive. In terms of its MPG, you can quite easily get over 40 miles per gallon on a longer run. And just to uh, preface this little test that we're doing, 
I drove all the way up to Leeds in this car, doing 70 miles an hour. I just whacked the cruise control on, 70 miles an hour the whole way, and I did 45.6 miles per gallon, which, for a car with a 3-litre, 340-ish horsepower engine, is genuinely really impressive. That's actually more than I used to manage in my Seat Leon Cupra, which was a 2-litre four-cylinder, so it just goes to show that you know, bigger engine doesn't always mean worse economy, especially when you're driving it efficiently. Then on the way back from Leeds, I was driving uh, fast enough to get myself a speeding ticket in three points. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and I still managed just under 40 miles per gallon. I think it was like 39.2. Um, so yeah, even if you're driving at higher speeds on the autobahn, don't do it in the UK, as I learned. Um, yeah, you'll still be uh, doing pretty good fuel economy figures. Round town though, it is a bit different, so a two litre engine will be a bit more efficient at slower speeds. But if I'm driving to work in this thing, I can still get just over 30 miles per gallon, which is really decent. Anyway, of course, before we get on the motorway, let's take it round a roundabout and have a quick taste of the handling. Okay then, into Sports Plus. This gives you dynamic traction, faster shifts, Work the gearbox into sports, it downshifts again, gives you even faster shifts. And then I'm gonna go for manual because this ZFA speed gearbox is fantastic when you take control of it yourself. And you think for a torque converter, it's so fast at shifting. And you can even downshift into first and it doesn't give you that weird jerkiness. There's a bit of traffic, so I can't really lean on it yet. But I kid you not, you can get this thing sideways very easily. I actually noticed if you give it half throttle, it lets you have a little bit more uh, slip at the rear in Sports Plus mode. Because if you give it full throttle, it kind of reins you back in just a little bit too quickly. Of course, if you want, you can just turn the traction control all the way off. And uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you're an experienced driver, as the open diff can make it a bit unpredictable, uh, especially on like drier roads. On wet roads, it's all right. But on dry stuff, yeah, you need to have your wits about you a bit. Anyway, let me show you the economy of this engine. Get it in Eco Pro, which is not a setting I use often. <laughs> but, you know, we'll use it for illustrative purposes. Let me just make sure all the uh, stuff is on. Yep, we're all good. Okay, let's get on the motorway and see what kind of MPG we can manage. So in Eco Pro, coming onto the motorway, I'll just give it sort of like quarter throttle. And this is where this big engine really comes alive. I mean, look at that. It just picks up speed so effortlessly. Come off the throttle, it starts coasting. It's just an unbelievably torquey engine, this. Then, once you're on the motorway, you have a fairly decent cruise control system. Um, it's a cruise control system with a brake assist. So this is slightly different from your regular system, where when you change the speed, it kind of just either idles the engine, or you know, like cuts the power, or just puts your foot down. Uh, in this, if you change the speed, it will actually use the brakes to slow you down, which is quite nice, because it means if you're going down a hill, you don't suddenly just pile on a load of speed. Um, but yeah, you whack the cruise control on, chill out, it's fairly quiet in here. It's akin to like an Audi A3, which is a pretty quiet car to, you know, do a lot of miles in. You know, it's not going to be like a Mercedes X-Class, but, it, you know, you're not going to get annoyed by the uh, cabin noise, even at higher speeds, above 70. Steering wants to, you know, go straight. Suspension, whilst it's a bit jittery, it is quite comfortable. So once you're at higher speeds on the motorway, you don't really notice that jitteriness that you get um, if you're really pushing the car. And yeah, it's just really good at munching a lot of miles. Seat, plenty of adjustment. As hot hatches go, it's got a much better seating position than something like a VW Golf R because you just sit lower. You feel more connected with the car. And you know already steering's more positive. It just feels like a sportier car the second you get in it. It doesn't feel quite as um, 
like well set up, but it does feel sportier. You can see already we're nearly doing 30 miles per gallon. So on a longer journey, when you're going faster, this is where the B58 is genuinely surprisingly efficient. Um, anyway, yeah, let's get on the motorway and see what uh, figure we manage. See you hanging with your friends, chilling. Day and night for days on end. Now you can't come see me tonight. Say you ain't got the time. I'm the last one you prioritize. Weeping, your IG pictures on my phone. I won't spend another night at home. Okay, I'ma just be on my way. Well, proof's in the pudding. Look at that. We managed 42.8 mpg. And that figure is still going up, 43.1 now. So yeah, over a longer journey, you're gonna get about 40, 45 miles per gallon, sitting at 60 to 70 miles an hour. Which, when you think about it, is just mental, because cars like the BMW 420i, the two liter B48 engine with 184 horsepower, did less. That only got around 40 miles per gallon. Um, and we had some traffic today as well, so I was having to slow down and speed up. And yeah, it's mental how efficient this car can be. So if you do a lot of long journeys, this is actually a really good hot hatch to use because it's got loads of power, loads of low down torque, so you're never having to shuffle through loads of gears to accelerate. It's comfortable, it's quiet, easy to drive hard to fault, especially on the motorway. However, once you're on a B road, what happens then? Let's go find out. Okay, here we go. Back into Sports Plus. Transmission in sports. Manual gears. Let's see if the 140i is a hot hatch of the gods. Or drives like a pancake. <laughs> now, traction isn't fully off yet, but as you can see, she's still quite leery. And you notice immediately, it's not full end car. What I mean by that is, you got the power, you got the rear wheel drive, balanced chassis, but everything's a little bit looser, it's a little bit more comfort orientated. And the dampers are the things that really stand out for me, especially the rear dampers. They just feel a bit like they haven't quite got control of the car. Like you hit a bump and it kind of bucks almost. But by no means is it terrible. Anyway, since we've got a double res delete, we may as well do a sound check. Hopefully there's not too much wind noise. Slow down. Oh yes. Now, with a double res delete, it basically just opens the sand of the car up. And it means sometimes you can get big cracks from the exhaust. It's very hard to pick them up on camera though. Anyway, look, you can push it round the corner. And it still does really well. Now, there's a lot of power going to the rear, obviously, so if you just put your foot down, it's going to overwhelm the rear tyres. And I think a lot of people come from cars like VW Golf R's, you know, Audi RS3's even, and they expect to just be able to put their foot down. You cannot do that in this car. You have to have to have to focus. Even in Sports Plus, if you don't really know what you're doing, you will lose control of the car. But front end, it doesn't feel immaculate. And there isn't a huge amount of grip compared to a proper M car, but it's really not bad. And you can see in Sports Plus there, it let me have a little bit of fun, but it quickly pulled the reins in because it's thinking, oh dear, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's gonna crash. But it'll allow you to have sort of that much angle before it really starts reining you in. Uh, brakes, so if we get to the 100 yard marker here, slam on the anchors. Now, they will always stop you, but they don't feel super reassuring to me. They just feel a bit, like, spongy, I think is the right word to describe them. 
but they're very capable. It's, it's weird. Like, they will always stop you. Um, even if you're on track, you have to do a good couple of laps before they start really fading. Uh, which, for a stock pad, is pretty impressive, actually. Most of the time, you sort of do one lap and you're absolutely... <laughs> you're, like, through the brakes completely. But look, if you just guide the throttle in... Oh, God, it's so quick. And you can't even get all the way through third gear before you hit the speed limit. Now, earlier I mentioned if you give it sort of half throttle, you can get it to rotate a bit more. So I'm going to try and demonstrate that now. Hopefully there's not too much traffic. But for anyone thinking about getting a double res delete, it's worth every single penny. And to me, I think it actually sounds better than a lot of very expensive systems. Anyway, let me uh, demonstrate this half roll thing. So half roll, uh, oh no, didn't, didn't quite work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's the nature of this car. And I think a lot of that comes down to the open diff, because it's shuffling power from one uh, wheel to the other. So it's giving a lot of work for the car's brain to do. If you have a proper mechanical diff, it's much more predictable. It's snappier, but more predictable. That's one um, thing I want to drive home to people, is a lot of people will get a limited slip diff in this and instantly bin the car because they think, oh, that means I just get more grip and it's going to be, you know, way better and more stable once you're drifting. Yes, it is. But the initial break of traction is much more sudden. You know, the car's much more eager to go sideways in a turn. In a straight line, it's got much more grip. But when you go around a corner and put your foot down, it's going to break traction really quickly. Uh, because, think about it, in an open diff, you're getting one wheel spinning initially, and then it's kind of grabbing the brake to try and get the other one to spin. Whereas when you've got a locking diff, it spins both wheels simultaneously, pretty much instantly. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. If you get a proper locking diff, just be very careful. Anyway, let's take this thing down a smaller B-road, and we can talk a bit more about suspension, and uh, just what it's like in general, I suppose. Okay then, let's give it some. <laughs> That's why you feel that open diff kind of squirming around the rear. It's not terrible though. Like it still controls the car fairly well. The only thing you really have to watch is your speed. You can see people complain about the suspension. We just went over that bump pretty much fine. I think people are kind of expecting like a proper M car and it's just not that. <laughs> what it is though is a lot of fun. Now then, I've fully disabled the traction control and we're gonna be a bit that we're gonna give it a sort of launch just to show you what it's like basically. So just gonna plant my foot. Spinning through first, second. You can see I basically had to put no steering effort in whatsoever. So people get very scared of these things because they're rear-wheel drive. And I mean, it's really um, quite controllable. But my god, for a stock car, is it quick. Almost as quick as that scooter. <laughs> And the steering's nice, you know. It's predictable. All right, one last time then. And look at that, planted my foot again. Traction, again, is fully off. You just have to treat it with a bit of respect, basically. You know, with a bit of work, it becomes an absolute monster of a car around a circuit. And if you're driving on the road, it's fine as it is. You know, some people really want to, like, do a lot with it, but... Oh my god, <laughs> it's so brutal. But it, it really doesn't need it if you're just going to drive it on the public road. You know, maybe if you live up north, it's a bit of a different story, because you can really push the car then. Um, but yeah, for 
if we're just driving round normal roads, like round London, there's not a lot that needs doing to it. I mean, for me personally, the mods I'm going to do is the Bilstein, or Bilstein, sorry, B8 dampers. Um, probably I'm going to put a limited slip diff on it at some point, just because I prefer the way those feel. Um, and then, what else? Maybe some bushes, you know, if I decide to take it to the track, because that just gives you a bit more of a connected feel. But other than that, it really doesn't need much doing. Um, a lot of people say the suspension is god-awful, like, you know, it's like a 60s Mustang, where the whole chassis kind of moves around independently of the actual wheels. It's really not like that. You know, something like a Honda i30N handles a bit better than this. A Megane RS, a Honda Civic Type car. And a lot of people are probably going to hate me for saying this. This handles far better than a VW Golf R does. Now don't get me wrong, the damping is worse than a Golf R, but it handles better. The overall balance of the car, the way it feels in a turn, is nicer. It's not more, you know, it's nowhere near as prone to understeer. And if it does start understeering, you just stab the throttle and immediately that kills the understeer. So yeah, if you want a car that you can modify for the track, it's perfect. But anyway, let me sort of digest all those thoughts and come back to you with a conclusion. So, what makes a car good? Memorable, even lovable. For me at least, the car has to have a human-like personality. And the BMW M140i is definitely one of those cars. It's the big, burly, reliable friend, the one that can always open the pickle jar. But look beyond the muscle and you'll find just a regular, awkward guy with the poise of an Irishman on St. Patrick's Day. But as you listen to each other, make small changes here and there, you'll start to notice changes in his personality. And it's those very changes that allow some of the best bonds, some of the best friendships to form. And that's why the BMW M140i is the car for me. As always, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, give it a like and why not subscribe? As not only can you see more content like this, you can see everything we have for sale, which includes the stunning BMW M140i from the intro. My name's Tom and you've been watching Paragon Cars. I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.